Well, how do I know which maps I'm going to need for the scenario that I'm playing? That is going to be found in the scenarios information section, which is located in the campaign and player guide. You can see it's got, uh, they're broken down just like at the table of contents. They're grouped into one map, two map, and four map campaigns. The one we're interested in today is Victory in the West. You can see it gives you a short little introduction about the scenario. It shows you the players. You've got Germany versus France and the Commonwealth. This would be a very good two-player game. It's an excellent uh, learning uh, game. You could potentially play it with up to three players, with one is Germany, one is France, and one is the Commonwealth. It gives you the first turn, the number of turns, and then the maps used down here, which is what we're looking at. This is the Western European map only. However, the only actual playable areas on the Western map we're going to be using are Belgium, France, Germany, Morocco, Netherlands, Senegal, and the UK. And it also gives you several other bits of information that you're going to need in the, uh, in the setup process. So for instance, it will tell you where the initiative marker goes. In this case, it's going to be um, on the axis plus two box and the axis starts with the initiative. It tells you what the last weather modifier was. It's going to be plus two to the weather rule. And it gives you the war status. So we know that Germany is at war with the Commonwealth and France and entry markers for the United States are not used in this particular scenario. Reserves, the status of reserves, all major powers have called out their reserves. Control is as specified on the map. There are some scenarios where the hexes that are controlled are going to be different from what's specified on the map because the campaign starts in the middle of um, in the middle of the war, where say some of the East Front um, scenarios where Germany has invaded the Soviet Union, they're going to control certain hexes uh, in the Soviet Union that are not marked as such on the maps. And then production, this will give you any um, information you need for production. We'll talk about that in a little bit. And then there are, further down, there are some special rules uh, for this particular scenario and any of the other ones. And it also is going to give you, finally, your victory conditions for uh, that particular scenario. You'll find this information for every scenario that they have in the game. For instance, if I was to turn over to the um, Fascist Tide, which is a two-map campaign, you can see the maps used here are going to be the American map and the Eastern and Western European maps. Now, this is a much longer game at 35 turns. It starts in September, October 39. And you can see it's got Germany and Italy versus France, the Commonwealth, the USA, and the USSR. So all of that type of information you're going to find in the uh, under the respective scenario in the campaign guide. So for our scenario today we're setting up, we're only going to need the Western European map. Uh, here you see I've laid out the uh, West Europe map per the scenario instructions. You are also going to need for every scenario to lay out the turn record chart here. This has the production circle as well as your various pools like your reserve pool, then lease pool, construction repair, also your initiative and impulse trackers, a lot of information on this one. So this is going to be used as well as the required maps in all of the campaign scenarios. I also have in the bottom left-hand corner of the Americas map here, they have provided a few spaces for you to use uh, the weather chits that they've supplied in the various weather zones. Now, this one we probably don't need. It's optional. Um, it's up to you whether you want to use it or not. If you are tight on table space, I would recommend not using it, particularly for this small scenario, because there's only really uh, two weather zones, the North Tempered and the Mediterranean, that are really going to uh, affect the, uh, the game. And you can always throw the chits somewhere on the maps here to remind you if you need it. Also, if you have the Ships in Flames expansion, and I do recommend you uh, you get it if you if you don't. It comes with a task force display uh, map or chart, uh, which comes in very handy for reducing ship clutter. We won't need this in this particular scenario today because the number of naval units involved is so small. But that is uh, that is again it's an it's an option. But I find it to be one of the most helpful ones. So for the bare bones minimum of what we need today, we have our West Europe map and the turn record chart. 
Now, once we have the maps laid out, you are going to, before you get any further, if you haven't done so already, you're going to need to decide which options you're going to use when you play this particular game. Now, Whiff is either blessed or cursed with a stupendous number of optional rules. As you can see here on the Optional Rules Manifest, which is inside the back cover of the rule booklet where they're all listed, you, it totals out at 60 various optional rules. Now, I recommend uh, photocopying this particular page, which will then allow you, as I've done here, to go ahead and actually mark in which particular optional rules you're using, as you can see I've done here from a, uh, from a recent game. Um, Selecting optional rules is going to be one of those things that takes you a while to do, particularly if the people you're playing with, with are folks that you have not played uh, before, because you can see with 60 uh, different optional rules to choose from, there are all kinds of permutations. So it could be fair to say that every local whiff group of players sort of has their own gaming experience based on the various combinations of optional rules that they've played. But uh, I recommend giving them all a try at least once. I can say that I have never played a game of whiff using all of the optional rules at the same time. Uh, but we've mixed and matched them over the years and we have our favorites and I'll probably do a video on uh, which ones that I really highly recommend um, and kind of give you my take on uh, on the various optional rules. So once the options are decided, and, and it's important to do this before you really do anything else because it's going to impact what counters you end up using in the game. So there's no point in going through the um, fairly tedious process of sorting out your counters into the various force pools uh, and uh, wasting time sorting counters that you're uh, going to end up not using in the game. So decide on your optional rules first, then once you've got the optional rules set and you know which pieces, playing pieces, you're going to be using in the game, then the next step is to sort the counters. And I'm going to show you a quick look at kind of my storage uh, technique that I use. It's fairly straightforward, I think. It's, you know, nothing genius, but uh, it's worked pretty well for me over the years. So we'll take a look at that and then we'll get into uh, sorting the counters. Well, here we have all of my counters stored um, for the game. I prefer, uh, at least for World in Flames, to use the uh, the, the baggy method. Um, I know some folks use the um, uh, game trays, the counter trays. That's fine. As a matter of fact, uh, just to show you that uh, here's a standard uh, counter tray. It does, in fact, fit into the box, no problem. Although, you can see here are... Uh, a couple of the maps, um, by the time you get all the maps in, I don't know how many of these counter trays will actually fit in that box. They're too big to fit more than uh, one side by side, so I'm thinking maybe two, three tr counter trays at tops are probably what you're going to get in this box. Um, that said, I go with the baggies for a couple of reasons. Uh, first of all, I know I can get them all into the uh, into the box. and. What I do is I've got one uh, fair size bag here uh, for each of the major powers. So I've got France and Germany. You can see uh, Commonwealth, Italy, etc. So I've got one for the major powers, but those are only the major power units that are in the force pools from 1939 and earlier. I then have a separate year bag because every unit in the game has a uh, year of availability printed on it. So I've got a bag for the 1940 Axis editions and a bag for the 1940 Allied editions. And I'll do that for each of the years. So we've got 40, 41, 42, 43, 44, 45, and then post 45. And that's one for the Axis, one for the Allies. So that when, the, when it comes time, uh, in January of each year to add the new units to the force pools. I simply grab the appropriate bag. I can sort these and then put them into the respective force pools. Now for this game, and it makes it rather easy because I'm going to need the French, I'm going to need the Germans, and I'm going to need the Commonwealth. Since it takes place in 1940, I'm also going to need the German units from 1940, 
and I'm going to need the Allied units from 1940. I keep all of the informational markers, the markers that you find on the turn record chart. I put those into a single small baggie here because I'll need those for every game. And that should be just about it. You can see I also try to split up the miners into a reasonable number of bags, which is quite a few. And the US entry markers are also split up by year. So there's 1939 and earlier, and then the 1940 bag, 41, 42, and 43. And then some of the informational markers here, such as the damage and uh, weather and no plane markers. So that's my storage system. Now that I've got the counters, I know I've got everything I need right here. It'll be a matter of sorting these into the force pools. And I think I showed you the uh, Dixie cup system I used before. I'm going to go ahead and get these sorted. Um, I will not make you sit through me sorting all these counters, I promise. And we'll pick up once I've got these units into the, uh, into the force pools. Now, while I'm sorting the counters, I thought I'd take this opportunity to give you an idea of what the footprint for the game is, especially for the smaller one map and two map campaigns. Now, if you've been watching the Global War scenario playthrough, that's that big four map campaign, and that was laid out on a uh, 10 foot by 6 foot gaming table. It takes pretty much all of the 10 foot uh, length of the table, but only about three feet of the uh, of the width. Now, obviously, not everyone has a 10 by 6 gaming table or even has room to put up a 10 foot by 6 foot gaming table. So here we have the one map scenario uh, for victory in the West that uh, that we're going through here. And you can see this table uh, that uh, the game is currently set up on here measures um, 54 inches wide by 74 inches long. So roughly the size of a uh, dining room table, certainly in that neighborhood, much smaller obviously than a 10 foot by six foot table. And as you can see, there is plenty of room for not just the main map board, but also we have the turn record display, the optional uh, task force display, and the America's map, which isn't used in this particular scenario other than for the, uh, the weather markers here. There's plenty of room for the force pool uh, cups that, uh, that I use, and you can see charts and tables, lots of elbow room. Uh, so a single map campaign should be able to fit on an even smaller uh, table than this. Let's take a look and see what happens uh, when we uh, try to set up a two map campaign. All right, here I've added the second European map to the uh, to the table. This would be the map required for the Fascist Tide two-map campaign, and it would be the equivalent size if you wanted to play the uh, Day of Infamy or Rising Tide, or I'm sorry, Rising Sun Pacific scenarios. Same uh, two maps, just with the Pacific rather than the European. And you can see it also fits on the same table. Again, we're looking at about four and a half feet wide by just a touch over six feet in length. And you could set this up a couple of different ways. I chose to slide the playing maps to the, uh, to the one end of the table and put the three smaller displays all on the same side. Again, if you're not using the ships in flames or the task force display, this would come off, which would give you even more room. We still have plenty of room for our force pools here and uh, some elbow space for, uh, for the players on either side of the map. So as you can see, no problem fitting the two map campaigns and everything else that goes along with it onto a, uh, a decent sized dining room table. And I want to take this one step further and show you potentially an alternate layout for the four map campaign, assuming you don't have 10 feet of linear space that you can use to set it up as uh, illustrated in the, um, in the actual uh, rules. So let's take a look at, uh, at the alternative four maps setup that you can use. Here we have the full four map campaign laid out in a different uh, different layout. So as you see in the book, it, it'll have you place the European maps here and then continue the Asia and Pacific maps out here for one long display. What I've done is simply line the maps up. We have the two European maps here on the left and the two Pacific maps on the right with the tops of the maps abutting one another. And you can see it forms a little more compact um, space for you to get all of the maps out. And in fact, 
for the first five editions of World in Flames, this is the layout that they used for the maps. There was one European map and there was one Pacific map, and they would have you lay them out with uh, the tops abutting one another, and the um, blue communication lines were actually drawn on those maps to connect up here at the top. So the one thing you have to be careful of if you decide to go with this layout, and it actually works very well, is that you make sure that the blue communication lines here that are connecting from uh, the Red Sea and the uh, Cape Basin over to the western edge of the, uh, of the uh, Asia map here, you make sure you're following the correct lines. And I would recommend if you have like a little yellow post-it note, some kind of sticky note, you can label. Uh, if, if you really want to, you could just write the label on the lines here in question uh, so that you know as you're tracing from one sea zone to the next uh, where, you're, where you're heading. Now, as you can see, I don't have any of the small displays on this, uh, on this table. There is still a little bit of room. Uh, so I would say this setup is about probably about four feet in width and uh, a little under six feet in, in length here. So we brought in a sideboard, if you will. We have another small table here next to the playing area where we have our turn record chart. All of the force pools we'll need, the uh, America's map, as well as the, uh, as the task force display. It would have been nice to get the America's map on the main table here with the, with the other playing maps, but uh, just wouldn't quite fit. So we've got it over here, but this is um, a certainly a very viable alternative to uh, having that 10 foot long uh, playing space. And I uh, wanted to show you that just to give you some ideas um, about uh, maybe ways to get this to your table. It's, it's a big game, so I know that's, that's not easy uh, for a lot of people, but a little imagination, uh, you can make it happen. I know back in the day, we would usually, we would have our main maps on uh, my buddy's uh, dining room table, and we'd set up a small little square, uh, like folding table, uh, card table, where we would keep everything else that didn't fit on there. So there's an idea of the footprint for you for the uh, various one, two, and four map scenarios. And uh, let's actually, uh, uh, while I'm sorting the counters into the force pools, there are a couple of comments I want to make on that. So let's go take a look at those.